Welcome everyone, first of all. Yeah, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Giovanni Fiore. I work as a fluid simulation specialist for uh, Dassault Systems. So I deal mostly with airflow simulations with uh, the technology so-called as uh, CFD, so computational fluid dynamics. And here today we have Michael Brooker, Peter Roberts and Professor Galbraith, uh, but I let them introduce themselves. I'll start with Michael. Thanks, Giovanni. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm part of Giovanni's team, really. I, I kind of support on the other side, on the client side, just making sure that the clients get what they need and when it comes to their simulation technologies. I mean, we'll get into the, the depths of it in a little bit, but of course, we do typically support you know, a wide array of different industries and not just civil engineering, but actually, you know, aerospace engineering as well, life sciences, um, you know, plentiful different types of industries. Um, but really excited to talk to you today specifically about airflow quality and you know dealing with COVID-19 and, and and future airborne threats as well. I hand over to Peter. Yep, thank you Michael. Um, my role is very similar to that of Michael. Um, I've just been doing it a few years longer I guess. <laughs> um, I think uh, over the next hour we were hoping to be able to share some of our Oops, he's lost your face. just disappeared. Yeah. Good start. <laughs> okay. Maybe we Maybe can go I over to Serene. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I can say it. <laughs> so I'm a, a virologist. Um, my job is about 50% teaching biomedical science students about infectious diseases, right through from diagnosis to treatment. And then the other 50% of my job is applied. Uh, virology research and um, we'll be talking a bit more about that uh, later on in Giovanni's presentation. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess Michael, yes, I think Peter will be back in a second. He just texted me on another chat. So let's wait a second. But yeah, so today uh, the goal of the, of the conversation will be on how to prepare um, and get the buildings ready for um, the potential threats that are now aerosols, as we all know. So specifically, I will talk about the simulations that we engaged uh, with several customers uh, around Europe and one main one with Professor Garbreth at uh, Leeds Becky University. So, Peter, you're back. Shall we start? Sorry about that. No worries. You can't quite beat technology, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we can. Yeah, I'm not really sure how far you got through uh, when I was when I disappeared, really. But um, uh, yeah, for, for me, uh, some of the points that have already been brought out in in the conference um, from from the keynote yesterday, and and also from Professor uh, Noakes this morning, I think some of the uh, the uh, experiences that we're going to share with you are, are very relevant, uh, and we're quite excited to be doing that. Okay, sounds good. Um, so yeah, if you want to, if you want to run that, that the yes. slides through. Giovanni so and, uh, the first thing is we're, we're going to introduce Dassault with a small clip. It's only 30 seconds. Hopefully you can see my screen. Mm. Give me a second. It's not presenting. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me retry. Better? Yeah. Yep, that's working. Okay. All right. I guess, Peter, up to you now. Sure. Yeah. I, I thought we'd uh, just set the scene really and, and try and put our involvement with uh, uh, Beza into, into context. Um, as a company, Desso System, um, we're about to celebrate our 40th uh, uh, birthday. 
uh, which in the technology uh, area is, is quite an old company really. But uh, we've pioneered some pretty key developments in, in the digital world um, from the first digitally, fully digitally designed aircraft with the Boeing uh, 777, uh, moving through into the first digital city of Singapore and more recently in, into life sciences. And we've been heavily involved in, in how data coming from the various vaccine test programs was, has been managed. And we're also involved in the pr provision of uh, collaborative digital marketplace when, when people were crying out for the design and production of ventilators. We got quite uh, heavily involved with that um, uh, uh, platform. Um, so although we cover a lot of different industries and a lot of different disciplines, uh, what we're going to talk to you about really today is specific for heating and ventilation. So maybe, Michael, you could put that into context. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, so I mean, to start things off, I thought, you know, maybe I'll start with a few quotes that we've we've seen online and, and things that you may have already seen yourself and read yourself as well. So first one comes from the engineer article, um, and I'll just read this out to you. So the pandemic has revealed flaws in the way in which buildings are designed, managed and operated. Now, I think it, it's fair to say that we've really opened our eyes post pandemic, you know, to, to question the readiness of our built environment. You know, is it safe enough? Is it is it good enough for our well-being? Um, I mean, just take schools as an example. You know, if anyone's got teachers or uh, or children within the family, then you'll you'll very well know that during winter months, they're just plunged into into the cold. Um, you know, due to the fact they have to leave their windows open. You know, why is that? It's because the ventilation systems are not sufficient. They're not good enough within schools, and it's not just schools. You know, we know there's many different types of scenarios where. Um, the ventilation and, and the safe measures in place are just not sufficient to deal with this, this type of virus, this type of contamination. And so we need to learn from this. We need to ready ourselves for the future. Um, another unfortunate and devastating quote comes from The Guardian, um, which is that up to 8,700 patients died after catching COVID-19 in English hospitals. And NHS data revealed that 32,307 people contracted COVID-19 while in hospital since March 2020. Now, you know, these are devastating figures, it goes without saying. Um, and these patients had no choice. You know, they had to seek medical attention, so they went to the hospital. And in that very environment, they were put under that significant risk um, to catch, you know, a deadly virus. And we, we, you know, we don't want that situation again. We want to want to learn from these lessons and do whatever we can really to to better the ventilation, to better the safe measures within hospitals and various different buildings as well. And the last one, just to set the scene for the topic of conversation uh, today, is from Catherine Knox, and and she presented this morning and advises the NHS and the government. And this is a quote from the Engineer article as well. Um, and it goes, we've got to give people the right understanding and knowledge to understand how their buildings work and therefore understand how they can use behaviours to manage those buildings effectively, but also then use technologies to mitigate some of those risks. So I think the key point here, and it comes up a number of times, is, is understanding, you know, how do we first understand what's going on and what's happening in the building? Because if we can then understand and build up some knowledge it's, it's then far easier to propose the right measures, the right solutions. Uh, and of course, there's no silver bullet. You know, it, it really takes all of these technologies together um, to build the right and sophisticated solution. So if we just move to the next slide now, Giovanni. So why are we here? Why did we join um, BISA? And we're very proud to be a member of BISA now. Um, well, it starts with a colleague, um, a colleague of ours, Emmanuel Vinoli. He was going to be on the call, unfortunately, couldn't make it today due to an urgent meeting. But he's an expert fluid dynamics expert, I like to Giovanni, um, and he supports our aerospace customers typically. Um, now, unfortunately, his grandmother was infected with COVID-19 during her stay in a hospital in France. Um, Emmanuel immediately contacted the medical director of the hospital to propose his expertise, his support using virtual simulations to really understand, you know, what is the cause of this? You know, how how has a COVID ward been able to infect a non-COVID ward? They're meant to be isolated, they're meant to be separated, and there's meant to be safe measures in place to prevent that from happening. Um, so of course, Emmanuel performed, you know, full, full digital simulations, which really gave some great insight into 
into what was happening, what was causing this. Um, he was then able to propose some really simple, safe measures like opening windows, opening doors, you know, certain scenarios um, to the hospital and even changing the ventilation system, uh, you know, output um, as well. And all of these ultimately were, were achieving a better result, you know, for the hospital, a safer environment um, and being able to segregate those two, those two scenarios. And that was all done within the space of two weeks. So just imagine what could be done if we embed this within our design, you know, thinking about the future now that we're, we're living in a slightly more post-COVID environment, what could we do for the buildings of the future? So I think on that note, um, and I, well, just to say, actually, you know, of course, then he presented that to the hospital. And I think it's fair to say that since then, it really kick-started initiative in Dasso. And we supported many hospitals, many venues and offices around the world since. Um, I'm really keen to, to see how we can support, you know, this industry much further as well. So I'll hand over to Giovanni. He'll take us through a few really good case studies to give you some examples, I think. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, yes, so I would like to start with one of the prime examples that we performed uh, together with La Philharmonie de Paris, uh, which is one of the main theaters in the world. So I'll take you there for a second. So imagine this enclosed uh, space, which uh, accounts for about 30,000 cubic meters of air and up to 2,400 seats plus the orchestra. And I'm mentioning the orchestra, as you can see, because it takes quite a lot of room in that, uh, in that hall. So we were asked from uh, we were asked by the the CEO of La Philharmonie to assess the quality of the air uh, within the environment, and the idea was to come up with measures and uh, recommendations for the staff and the public um, <clears throat> for returning to a normal life. So what we've done was creating a digital twin of what's uh, the actual theater looking like when the airflow is uh, operating. And so here you see an animation of an actual airflow simulation. So it's not uh, graphics, um, but um, as you can see, there are two main behaviors of the air. So from the left to the right, you see air being funneled through the um, to staircases and the balconies, and the same happens on the right hand side. And then air is colliding in the center of the hall, and then goes up towards the ceiling. Now this is a behavior that is fully dictated by the airflow dynamics and also the, the thermodynamics of people uh, which are there and are represented with their body heat uh, generated. But if we go in a bit more detail, so here you can see two plots of velocity. Uh, so this is the uh, airflow velocity. So in the main, in the, in the plot to the left, in the animation to the left, you can see that airflow is cascading from the balcony as we were just saying. And as the air is coming down from the balconies, it actually gains momentum. Similar thing happening on the right hand side. And again, the two streams uh, collect, well, gather in the center and then they go upwards. Now, first of all, you can see that two people uh, sitting on a similar balcony, they're not experiencing the same airflow, for example, which is quite interesting already. But on top of this, depending where you sit and depending on how much mechanical ventilation you have there, uh, you have a completely different experience of, of the airflow there. And I'm talking specifically about the top left corner and the top right corner on the right hand side uh, animation. Let me play it again. Yeah, so you'll see a very mild upwards airstream and this is fully generated by the body heat. So keep in mind that every person in this simulation actually has uh, heat. So the simulation is accounting for that. So as you can see, the people up here, they see a completely different sort of comfort there as opposed to the people sitting just below the balconies where air is cascading from their back. So the first thing we can say is that, yes, maybe we are all aware of the mass flow rate in the room. We know how well the, uh, the HVAC system is working, but we cannot really say that two seats show the same uh, sort of comfort or uh, airflow velocity. And so what we've done is simulating the airflow with two different settings. So we set the HVAC system to full power and then to 50% of that power. And the first thing, interesting thing is that the majority of air is actually funneled by the staircases. And this is because air does not like being blocked. And so it will always find uh, um, a path where you have the, less the least resistance, potentially. And 
as you see here, this is uh, common behavior at both 100% of the power and at 50% of the power. So if you relate this to actually your daily experience, it, it's just as if uh, you know you go to the cinema one day, you're watching uh, the movie, and it's a hot day, summer day outside. So the ventilation system, the HVAC system, is set to a high level. If you stand up and you go, for example, to the bar to grab a snack, you'll feel immediately cold in your legs. And this is because the staircases are actually funneling a lot of air um, through themselves. So what's the implication? If somebody would cough in this theater, what's the implication at that point with respect to the particles and the aerosols that that person is generating? So to the left, you see a person coughing with 100% of the power of the ventilation system, and the other one is at 50%. So there's a bit of a difference in the distance that is traveled by the, um, by the particles and also how quickly um, the particles are actually going towards the ground. So for example, at 100%, the particles do travel a certain distance, but at 50%, they actually uh, don't come to the floor at, the, at that same rate, which is telling you that, as Professor Knox was also saying earlier today, um, it's not always true that increasing, um, let's say, across the board, the um, the ventilation rate will improve the situation. It, it's really much case dependent, and it's also dependent on where you sit and depending on the layout of the room. So before going on, we always get this question. So how do you do these sort of simulations? And uh, here today we have also Professor Galbraith from Lise Becker University. And here I'm going to show you a bit of the work we're performing with uh, with them. So. With Professor Galbraith, we are studying the airflow rate in a lecture hall of the university. And uh, what we've done is we started from blueprints, because typically uh, we don't always have CAD available, but in some cases we do. Um, so we start from blueprints. You see them here to the left. And we have some photographic evidence or just visual inspection. And we start modeling literally the furniture, the layout of the room, and mostly, most importantly, the location of the outlets and inlets. Now, as you can imagine, the location of outlets and inlets is obviously driving the whole performance of the ventilation system, together with also the very important so-called boundary conditions. And I'm talking about boundary conditions when I speak about pressure, airflow velocity, temperature, mass flow rates, all of those. So once you have all these properties, you can then generate a simulation that is uh, as much as possible close to reality. So as you can imagine, for a lecture hall, it's really important to capture the right location of the outlets and inlets. So uh, we have some uh, inlets at the, at the ceiling and some outlets at, you know, just below the seats. But as you can imagine, the seat relative to the inlets is actually um, a problem when, of course, you, you think about airflow blockage. So it's really important to capture the detail here. And as you can imagine, people will be sitting on these chairs and they will offer the blockage themselves. So we spent a bit of time to, to try and uh, model this with much, as much details as we could, because we know that this will affect the final results. And so when we have put together everything uh, in the model, now we can compare you know, the photographic evidence and you know, reality with what we have, and we can say that, yes, the model is fully satisfying and uh, we can start the simulations. So I'm just going to show you a glimpse of the flow field here at, uh, for example, one of the uh, lecture hall at Leeds Beckett University. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, two main jets from the ceiling. These jets go, of course, towards the, the floor, but we have uh, uh, several outlets just below the, um, uh, the seats. It's not playing well, OK. Um, now, as you see, it, the airflow generates two main vortices to the sides of the room. And the majority of the air is actually um, hitting you know, the students or the people in the, in the audience. But what can we say about, for example, the lecture, the lecturer uh, position? As you can see, um, the airflow going in that direction is relatively uh, mild. And in principle, if we had, let's say, a contaminant, uh, we can say that the location here where the lectern is is probably experiencing a very different airflow rate than what's happening uh, for the students. Now, maybe nominally, as you uh, as you may imagine, the airflow uh, is properly sized for the room, but it's not really this. Let's say this figure is not really telling you how the airflow is then evacuated by the room itself. So, with Professor Galbraith, who's here today, 
Uh, the idea is to model essentially uh, the contamination for the students there. And maybe we can ask you know, uh, for the details to the professor who was here today. So this is a great system for us to use because it allows us to model um, the airflows in our lecture theatre. So the project itself is looking at spread or transmission of coronavirus amongst the group of people in the lecture theatre. And we're using the modelling not only to model what happens if someone's infected with the virus, we're also using it to allow us to test UVC inactivation devices. And this modelling will allow us to fit them in the optimum place to ensure that the airflows that they take in from the room are optimised. And then that allows us to ensure they're working effectively and we can then test them. So what we have is a model that allows us to look at spread of the virus and also allows us to test uh, UVC disinfection in that particular room so we can optimise it. And this then serves as an excellent model for any other larger building that has a number of people entering and exiting it. Because, of course, this lecture theatre is in use during the day. So we have approximately 50 to 100 people um, entering and exiting the room for periods of between an hour and two hours. OK, thank you very much, Professor. Um, so, yes, so one of the next goals for this study will be to actually model the purifiers as you know, as Professor as, uh, Galbraith was saying. And depending on the performance that we get from the simulation, we can adjust the position, the rate of the purifiers, the rate of the uh, HVAC system, and try to find an optimum solution. That's that's the idea. So it's a work in progress, but uh, it's uh, it's very promising and uh, we wanted to, to showcase it today. So, okay. Now I'm gonna move to the next uh, case study. So if we steer away from these two applications, we wanted to show uh, a bit more what uh, we are also capable of. So now going away from a lecture theater and an actual theater, we're now going to an operating theater. Um, and this is uh, this model is actually designed based on an actual operating theater in the Netherlands. So here the goal was to assess the quality of the airflow for this very uh, peculiar um, ventilation system, where the goal is to isolate effectively the aerosols generated by the doctors and the clinicians from the patient who's going to be on the operating table. So as you can see, the layout of the HVAC system is very, uh, let's say, different from what you see on a typical office, for example. And the goal is to create this seal where air is literally uh, uh, dividing the room in different sectors. So air is pushed from the ceiling in a square layout fashion and then is taken out of the room from uh, vents that are located in each corner of the room. And now the question is, is it really effective if we place like a particle or a contaminant in the room? And so that's what we've done. So we created four emitters of particles here and these four emitters of particles are modeled after actual uh, experiments. So these have an emission rate that is exactly the same as experiments. And we had a, a spread of diameters that is exactly the same as experiments. Well, so what we wanted to see is how many of these particles actually hit the, uh, the operating table. And if you take this animation to the left and make it into a, a long time exposure photo, you see to the right that actually the majority of the particles, especially the heavy ones, they tend to either remain aloft in these um, vortices or the heavy ones, they actually go straight to the ground and they disappear. Well, they don't belong to the simulation anymore at that point. But interestingly, there's no particle whatsoever hitting the uh, operating table at all. So that means that this simulation was capable of capturing the experiments that uh, were performed in the in this operating theater in the Netherlands, and we're able to validate our tools, um, vice versa. Okay, now speaking of, of hospitals still, so I'm, I'm gonna go back to the example that Peter introduced earlier. Uh, so this is the uh, Maran Silvange Hospital in Paris, and that's where, that's where Emmanuel's uh, grandmother was uh, uh, taken care of. Um, so as you see, it has two wards. One is the COVID ward in yellow, and one in uh, white is the non-COVID ward. One of the concerns there was that 
the particles and the aerosols generated in the COVID world would actually travel to the non-COVID world. And as you can imagine, it can be uh, very dangerous. So what we've done is simulating a person, a patient per stall, uh, coughing at the same time. So it's a relatively worst case scenario in that sense. And we want to monitor how the concentration of the contaminant would travel uh, across the, the whole uh, floor of the building. So here you have an animation of, on the top, you have the contamination of the, uh, of the particles. And on the bottom, you have the velocity distribution. So let's focus a bit on the velocity distribution first. So as you see, there's a quite a striking uh, airflow going through the corridors of the, of the hospital. And it funnels a lot of, let's say, velocity um, from one ward to the other. And if you focus in this uh, red circle, where actually now we have the concentration of particles or the contaminant, you'll see that actually there is a spill of uh, contaminant from one ward to the other. And this is in nominal conditions where the HVAC system is set to a nominal value. And the whole HVAC system results in a pressure gradient, which is the one that you see at the bottom uh, left here. So let's say there's a high pressure in the COVID ward and there's a relatively low pressure in the non-COVID ward. So that was a first observation that we, uh, we performed. And so the first thing that we suggested was actually reducing the ventilation in the non-COVID ward. So we went from this gradient, red to blue, to this gradient, red to green. So essentially the, the, the gradient is now milder. And if you look at what's happening now at the interface in the, on the top right corner, you see that the concentration of contaminant is, is actually reduced quite severely. So this is, for example, one of the measures that we suggested and it was already effective as it was, but we tried to go further. And we did a third variant where instead of uh, playing with the pressures of the HVAC systems, we're now playing with some um, windows located in specific areas of the, of the hospital, of course, where you can, because one of the problems is that not everywhere you can open uh, windows in an hospital. Um, but yes, so there was a similar effect. So at the top, you see the velocity here. And at the bottom, you see the concentration of the particles. So if you compare uh, the red circle here with what happened on the baseline here to the left, actually now you'll see that, yes, the spillage is actually a lot, uh, um, a lot reduced, very much reduced. So moving away from the hospitals, um, we had a, a very interesting cooperation with a, a company in Germany. Uh, this company asked us to assess the airflow quality for a canteen in Germany. And the idea was to simulate uh, that environment at this busiest time. And as you can imagine, when you are at lunchtime, um, everybody wants you know, to, to go to eat, to get lunch, and the, the, the whole room gets very crowded. Now, depending again on the layout of the HVAC, on the layout of the furniture, and how many people are there, the situation could become more or less critical. So the company asked us directly to try and assess the quality of the air um, in a scenario that is, uh, let's say, probable. So what we've done is simulating three different people coughing at the same time. And as you can see, the generation, well, the, the cloud of particle that's been generated does not spread in the same way, uh, depending on where you are, depending on the effect of the HVAC locally, and also depending on the layout of the room. So as you can imagine, this sort of, um, information, the outcome of this is was used uh, to inform you know, the, the employees and to inform uh, the management, the facilities management, sorry, uh, about the, num the most number of people that could be in that room at any given time. But if we steer away from a canteen, now we have a similar application, but for an office where, as you can imagine, the HVAC system is always in operation as if it was a standard uh, working day. And you have a person coughing. So in the background, you can see the airflow driven by the HVAC system, and then the person is coughing in that environment. So what we wanted to show here is that depending on your behavior, your social behavior, you may actually have a completely different uh, footprint uh, with respect to where the particles land and in what quantity they land and where they land. So here we wanted to simulate the person coughing without covering their mouth and having this sort of uh, footprint on the on the floor and then having the same event but actually now the person is covering their mouth 
as you can see, the cloud of particles is not traveling nearly as far, and also the footprint is actually not as, as wide. So in principle, we can capture not only what's happening in the air, so within you know, the enclosed volume, but actually also on the surfaces. So now, if we move away from uh, those examples, I want to show you what could happen, for example, in a very uh, large environment, such as, a, such as the lobby of an airport. Um, so imagine that you're now queuing at the airport and you have the HVAC system surrounding you. The layout for the HVAC system is very different from the lecture hall, from an operating theater and so on. But it's very important for us to capture, for example, how many, um, how much time it takes for the full room to be renewed as far as the air contamination. So here, what we've done is, depending on the layout of the inlets and outlets, we wanted to monitor how much time it takes for a potential contaminant to be fully flushed out of the room. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that yes, nominally the HVAC system will tell you how many renewal you should have per hour, because you can account for the same amount of air within that enclosed volume, but it doesn't tell you how the density of such a contaminant evolving over time. So here you have such density of the contaminant, basically the concentration of the contaminant. And what we've done is simulating different scenarios for the HVAC system and different scenarios for the layout of the inlets and outlets. And you'll see in a second the comparison that within three minutes, the two solutions, actually the, the three solutions have a completely different uh, um, outcome, as you see here. So obviously in red is more contamination, in blue is fresher air. So not very different from that. If we go to a much smaller uh, office space like this one, here we've done an engagement with a company again in Germany, if I remember right, and we tried to um, monitor the amount of contaminant over time, the, so the concentration of contaminant, when a purifier was in place. So keep in mind that for this simulation, uh, the purifier is acting alone, so there's no HVAC system, but the idea was to have a worst case scenario where the purifier is only is doing the whole the whole work itself. So what we've shown here is that it takes about 50, 55 minutes for all the contaminant to be flushed out of the room. So here in these two graphs, uh, you see a blue line and uh, yeah, the trend is decaying steadily over time, as you can see also from the animation. So these are uh, technologies that can give an indication of the quality um, of the air and also potentially tell you how effective or not effective uh, a solution is for purifying the air, for example. Okay, but before we go further, I wanted to mention a bit of the uh, background that's, uh, let's say, the work behind the scenes that we've been uh, performing. So back at the height of the pandemic uh, in China, Dassault was asked to perform a simulation on an emergency hospital that was just about to be built in Wuhan. And the idea was not only to assess the airflow quality indoor, but also the airflow quality outside of the, uh, of the hospital. Because as you can imagine, an emergency hospital will be built somewhere in a city. But then the problem is how many of these aerosols are actually hitting the, uh, the city, for example. So here you see an animation of the airflow quality indoor, so similar to what we've done in France, but also we wanted to simulate what's happening outside. So we had to model the dominant winds, and we also may put ourselves in a worst case scenario where all uh, people are coughing at the same time with a very high concentration. So this animation is not telling you that the city is experiencing the aerosol transmission, it's only telling you that the particles eventually could travel in that direction. And obviously, all these studies are actually uh, science-based, so we're not inventing uh, the wheel here. We're literally um, using what's there, what's available in the scientific literature to model our simulations. So at the top here, in the top right corner, you can see an actual person coughing, and at the bottom, uh, you see the same thing, but happening in the simulation. So the idea is that we implemented in our simulation the same uh, coughing history, the history of velocity, for example, and the, the size distribution of the particles, um, so that the simulations are, are as accurate as we can. And if you combine all these informations, yeah, well, these, for example, in this animation here, 
this technology can be well used um, for evaluation for evaluating the social distancing, for example. So going back to the the first uh, example that I've shown you, the technology that we've proven uh, today, well, in the, the recent months, was actually used for a number of uh, public communication. One of them was uh, for the La Philharmonie de Paris. So these animations, uh, the graphs, were actually used by the management to uh, assure the staff and the public uh, for you know going back to the venue. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, one of the key tools uh, that we use on a daily basis as CFD engineers is that the airflow, of course, in nature cannot be seen very easily at all, but CFD can actually allow you to, to visualize it and it can be a powerful tool of communication. Okay, so just a few closing remarks on my side. Um, now, from now on, as you can imagine, um, there will be a question on how we organize public spaces. I'm thinking of queues in public offices or in universities, in hospitals. And the question is, when we have this sort of technology, we can, at that point, investigate so many more scenarios compared to just doing them in real life. For a number of reasons, some of these uh, offices or indoor spaces may not be even available at the moment for this sort of experiment sometimes. Um, but you know, the CFD can be one of the tools in the box to help uh, making these sort of decisions. So, for example, when if we go back to the example at the uh, the, uh, at the airport, um, yeah, depending on how air is renewed, you can decide on the layout of the queuing uh, system, for example, on the layout of the stalls and things like these. These are things that we can do quite easily. Um, and on top of this, this technology could allow in the future to um, to to have safer. Uh, uh, public uh, environments, basically, and depending on uh, the figure of merits, and this is an open debate, as we saw multiple times uh, recently um, in the in the Beza uh, the Beza conference. Uh, it's not easy always to to agree on one KPA. So it's an open question, but you can definitely monitor things like the concentration of a contaminant, the concentration of particles, and so on. So. All these examples that we delivered today, um, as you can see, they are very much uh, case by case dependent. So there's no such a thing as one size fits all. Um, so depending on the HVAC system, depending on the layout, depending on how many people are there, actually um, the solution might be different. And sometimes it's not particularly hard to implement, but sometimes it will take some sort of retrofitting. Um, it would require some, some sort of retrofitting as we mentioned earlier. Um, now, as I was saying, the simulation is one powerful tool, but the most powerful tool is actually the visualization that comes after the, the, the simulation. So, as you can imagine, gas is invisible, but you know, creating these uh, uh, these visuals is actually powerful for communicating for communicating with the public. And up until now, all you've seen here is uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, the so-called CFD. Um, and is a technology that allows us to simulate the airflow um, as it evolves in indoor spaces and, uh, and it's well adopted in the other sectors of the industry like aerospace or automotive industry. Okay, so here are a few contacts. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we're open for a bit of a debate, Michael and, Rob and Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And anyone who's got any questions, you know, feel free to put those in the Q&A. We did also post the poll as well. So feel free to post your votes in and we can we can kind of discuss around that as well. Uh, the poll question was, what technology would you like to use to assess airflow quality? And of course, there's a variety of different options there. Um, yeah, and we can, we can always discuss that and show that in a little bit. But yeah, I mean, you made a very good point, Giovanni, about you know, certainly when it comes to visualization, I think, you know, it's come within a number of talks. How do we kind of build the case for, you know, better ventilation? It's not something you can visually see. And so it's very difficult, you know, from a government or a building or whatever it might be, a contractor, um, to really justify, you know, improving the ventilation. And what does that even mean as well, putting it into context? Um, and that's really what we feel this technology can, can be providing. 
Yeah, so one thing, one lesson that we definitely learned is that uh, um, the nominal properties of the ventilation system don't tell you the full story. And again, it's not a surprise. It's not that we discovered anything new. But when you see this applied to an actual environment, uh, you see more what, uh, what that would entail for uh, people living in that environment, for example. And this is, this is something that becomes very relevant, for example, for hospitals especially. But as it was mentioned several times during the conference, um, there's no, let's say, legislation around the quality of the air per se in certain uh, environments. And so that means that there's something else that we need to do to assess the quality uh, for specific places, for example. So we've got one question coming in. I'll pose it to Peter. <laughs> he can take this one. But um, yeah, the question is, what's the kind of cost for this analysis? Oh, thank you, you're muted. Peter, you're muted. We cannot hear you. Okay. Oh, I think he's coming on now. <laughs> Am I? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Um, I've been online, offline for the last 40 minutes, so uh, apologies for that. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, the cost of it all, it, it kind of... Um, Depends on all sorts of things, really. Depends on um, uh, the data that you have available in the first instance in, in terms of whether you've got three-dimensional CAD geometry or whether you've got 40-year-old uh, um, paper plans that we have to work from. Uh, that comes down to manpower. The size of the, um, the model that you create or the, the digital twin that you create affects how long it takes to run on the computer so if you as you can imagine the difference between doing a a, a small classroom and uh, that um, auditorium in, in paris uh, huge difference in scale uh, and when you get to the outside uh, world uh, again difference in scale i think he's gone again unfortunately <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean the, the, the summary i suppose of that is that yeah, it can significantly vary. Um, so there is certainly no kind of one one specific cost. It's very much case by case. Similar to the actual simulation itself, it's very much case by case. Um, so that is something that we can always you know, discuss directly with yourselves um, based on your particular needs. And feel free to get in touch with us afterwards. Um, we'll be happy to, to talk a bit more about it. So we've got one other question here. How can clients value ventilation when a successful design is unseen? Architects will spend more time choosing the RAL number over the uh, over the Louvre. <laughs> I'm going to pronounce that wrong. The, the, then the design of the ventilation system. I don't know, if, Giovanni. Do you have any insights on on that one? Um, okay, ventilation works. Isn't seen. Um, can you articulate more on that? Sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit. I don't think I understand the question. Architects will spend more time choosing. I, yeah, I think maybe what they're trying to say is that there's more time in optimizing things that uh, might not be as necessary. We can happily take that one offline. If you want to provide us a yep. little bit more detail, we can always answer that question. And let me just, oh, I see another one coming in. Oh, there's plenty of questions coming <laughs> up. Okay. What role do you think UVC or other air cleaning systems play in achieving adequate ventilation? Should they only be used if adequate ventilation cannot otherwise be achieved? Well, this is a really good question. So we saw a very strong spike in interest for this technology, so UVC lamps. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of these are used in hospital environments as of now, but the technology would like to be more uh, democratized and uh, enter everybody's yeah, home potentially. Now, the question is if that lamp can purify more or less air with and without a good HVAC system. Typically, the answer is they should work together, in my opinion, in the sense that, as we were showing earlier with uh, Professor Galbraith, there's no one 
uh, ideal position of the uh, of the UVC lamps in the sense that you cannot envision this without knowing how the HVAC system is performing. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about raw numbers or nominal numbers. I'm talking about the recirculation areas or where an outlet is or where the streamline looks like around a specific object. So I think they should work together, uh, if anything. Um, and you need to be also careful that maybe the air that is fed by the HVAC system is, all, is already quite clean. So you should not, in principle, purify or feed just this air to the UVC uh, device because it wouldn't make sense. It would basically prefer uh, the air would, would, would be filtered after being already filtered, which of course is not optimal. So the idea is that you should place it strategically such that it collects some contaminant from one side of the room and attracts the streamline in its direction so that these streamlines are already, uh, let's say, uh, contaminated in a way. So hopefully, you know, I, I reply to this question. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. And there's just another one here. So if they succeed, they are unaware of the system, it, they are not hot or cold and can't see or feel it. And I think that relates to something that was brought up in some of the other talks as well on, you know, when it comes to ventilation, you can't always see it. And I think we you alluded to that, Giovanni. Um, yeah. I think the unique thing about virtual simulations is that you can simply perform an animation, for instance, of the contamination over time to see how the ventilation system is able to recycle and replenish that air with new, um, fresh and and uh, and healthy air as well. So it's kind of giving you that visual, isn't it, Giovanni? I suppose. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so as Michael was saying, this technology was developed for cars and airplanes. Um, now. For that industry, there are some very strong KPIs that everybody agrees on. And one of them, of course, is drag for vehicles or lift for an airplane. For these simulations, the question is slightly different because A, each room is very different from one another. And second, there's no, uh, let's say, strong KPI at the moment. But one thing that you can definitely monitor is the concentration of a contaminant like we've done for some of the animations, or something that I haven't shared with you today, but it's the number of particles extracted by the ventilation system. So you model a source of particles, which can be somebody's coughing or just a source of particles as if it was dust. And then over time, you monitor the amount of particles that are extracted by your purifying system. And just comparing one version to one other version of the same technology can tell you which one is performing better. And that's something that we typically do for our simulations. And that's something that is very, let's say, uh, readily understandable by anyone. It doesn't, you don't have to be an HVAC engineer, you don't have to be an aerodynamicist or an architect. If you see that, you know, the number of particles is increasing, well, the extracted ones, well, then you opt for that solution instead of for the previous one. So once you have that visualization, that's all it takes. It doesn't really take much more than that. I think we appreciate it's a challenge and it's it's a change in the way the industry kind of operates, isn't it? So I think, you know, but I do believe this can support it. You know, it's not going to be the only thing that's going to be able to support yeah. and change views, but but it can be part of that. It can it can help you in your business if you need to be be kind of proving these 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 effectiveness of of the of the changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. And Sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, uh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. No, I was. W what I wanted to say is that uh, in uh, a few instances that I presented today, um, not only we run the CFD, but actually the clinicians and the doctors uh, made sure that they collected samples over time in certain locations of the hospitals, for example. So, in one example that I haven't shared today, um, they went in those specific rooms that saw a certain level of contamination after X number of COVID patients. And they sampled cer certain locations of the room. And the idea was to try and see what the simulation would say. And we saw there was actually a pretty good match. And on top of that, we were able to share some other locations that they didn't, they, the doctors didn't think of because they're either remote or just not easy to think about. For example, in an operating theater, uh, we shared that there was potential contamination on the, on the lights placed above the uh, operating theater itself. And in fact, uh, a couple of weeks later, the clinic and the and they found out that actually yes, because of how the HVAC system is driving the particles upper on you know in the room, they were actually particle depositing on these uh, lights, on these lamps, uh, you know, close to the ceiling. So what we can say is that yes, this is a one tool uh, that we can use to assess the quality of the air, and a lot of times be 
before validating, before releasing all these solutions, they need to be validated with uh, experiments as well. But a lot of times when we have a technology like this is mature enough, you can start to make some good assumptions that you're doing something realistic. Absolutely. So I can't say any of the Q and A's for anyone who's got any questions, feel free to paste them in the Q and A box. We did have a poll as well, and I just I've just shown the results of that. And it's only a few votes, so it's a little bit of a, a small sample. But um, we've got we've got one for experiments, we've got a couple for simulations, and uh, a four for all of the above. And the question was, what technology would you like to use to assess airflow quality? I think the poll is uh, is evolving as we speak, actually. Oh, so yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And again, yeah, we, we think that simulation is one tool. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a trick question, isn't it? Because I suppose you know, you don't. There's no. There's no. Uh, there's no further details there. You know, how much does the experiments cost? Is it even feasible to do the experiments? Um, you know, sometimes it's not always possible to to get in, and especially if you're thinking about new designs for buildings as well. Um, you know, we're talking about conceptual designs, so at that stage, you don't always have that experimental data to rely on, and sometimes having that virtual method in place can really help you to inform that design. Um, to, to let you get to that stage where you can then start to test, start to ensure yes. that actually you're getting the results that you that you wanted. So it's really going to be a mixture, isn't it, of, uh, of kind of a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah so Michael, uh, in the past couple of days, I heard the, the word retrofitting a lot, which is something that uh, it is a solution after, you know, modeling either a simulation or conducting experiments for specific cases. But one thing that, yes, the future uh, is going to hold for us is that uh, these sort of simulations will be part of the design loop as in other industries. So again, if you were going to design a, a car or an airplane, you just don't go with one design and then you make that plane, you iterate over these parameters and usually it's lift, drag or things like that. In the future for buildings, um, the idea is that yes, the air quality will be a KPI and the designer can iterate with these simulations at hand, decide on the outcomes and yeah, keep going until they're happy with the results. So I think it's it's something that is happening. There's a strong push for that. And uh, I'm, I'm quite excited to see it because um, yeah, it's bridging a few gaps, I think. Definitely, yeah. So let me just ask you a question, Giovanni, if you don't mind. Um, so I think sure. you know one of, one of the questions that we often get when we speak with uh, with people is, you know, if you're a non-expert, you're not a typical analyst, not someone who would typically use simulations or physics-related software in your day-to-day -day career. You know, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of effort for you to then go ahead and learn something completely brand new in an area that you might not be familiar with. Um, is it even feasible to do that? How do we get around that barrier of of you know actually requiring the expertise? Yeah. Sure. So um, as Dassault, we offer uh, a wealth of services. So typically, what we do is we engage with a potential customer, they would provide all the inputs. We have, of course, an NDA in place and IP restrictions, of course. And at that point, if they provide the geometry, all the inputs that we need, we can create a model and then run the simulations for them. We have a wealth of uh, computational clusters in-house. Um, so we don't really need to rely on external technology at all at that point. Uh, essentially, the, the input will be given to us and then the output will be also given back to the, uh, to the customer still by us. And at that point, depending on what the customer would like to do, investigating another geometry, investigating another layout, yeah, it's easy for us to just modify the existing simulation and rerun it, you know? Sometimes, for example, I'm thinking of the operating theater, sometimes it takes as little as a few hours to run. Sometimes, depending on the size of the room, it may take a couple of days, but that's something that is absolutely within our standards. It's not particularly, let's say, tricky so we provide the expertise if uh, in a nutshell yeah. yeah brilliant okay well i think if there's no further questions i think i'm happy if, if that's okay with you giovanni we can probably end the session here um you know thank you very much yeah for all of your thank you very much of course and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch and uh, yeah, we look forward to discussing with you yeah thank you thank you michael thank, thank you, you peter bye have thank a nice you. day Cheers. bye, -bye.